So today uh, we don't really think of werewolves too often uh, in terms of being a real cryptid or a real uh, paranormal phenomenon. It's one of those things that is generally taken quite lightly by a lot of people. However, if you go back to the 15th and 16th century, werewolves throughout Europe were regarded in the same light as witches and wizards, and anyone suspected of being a werewolf was burnt or hanged with the utmost cruelty. Especially in places like Central and Eastern Europe, in fact, there were actually trials, much like witchcraft trials, in France, uh, for example, in one period of little over 100 years between 1520 and 1630, France could record a staggering 30,000 cases of werewolfism, a fact documented in the proceedings of werewolf trials that are preserved in the public records. And there must have been plenty of howling around that time period. For example, in 1573, at Dole, near Dijon, in central France, a man that was claimed to have been a werewolf named Gilles Garnier was accused of devastating the countryside and devouring small children, and after confessing to the crimes, was burnt at the stake. It's possible that, as in lots of witch trials, this man was persuaded, so to speak, to confess through lots of uh, torture. And years later, in 1598, in a wild and desolate area near Caud, a group uh, also in France, a group of French countrymen stumbled across the horribly mutilated, blood spattered body of a 15 year old boy. A pair of wolves, which had been devouring the corpse, ran off into a nearby thicket as the men approached. They gave chase and almost immediately they found a half-naked man crouching in the bushes, sporting long hair and an unkempt beard and long, dirty, claw-like nails, uh, basically in a state of dishevelment, which were clotted with fresh blood and the shreds of human flesh. The man, called Jacques Rollet, was a sort of a somewhat simple-minded man, who became a cannibal. Um, he'd been in the process of tearing to pieces the corpse of the boy when disturbed by the countrymen. Whether or not there were any wolves in the case, except those that excited imaginations, may have covered it up. It is impossible to determine, but it's certain that Rollet supposed himself to be a wolf and killed and ate several people under the influence of this delusion. A psychiatric condition known as lycanthropy. He was sentenced to death, but the law courts of Paris reversed the sentence and charitably shut him up in a madhouse. And believe me, a madhouse in those days would not have been a nice place to be, especially if you're thought of as a werewolf. An institution where most suspected werewolves would probably have lived out their days rather than being executed. So if these, this pro prolific ancient uh, French French werewolf you were thought of as one you would be shut in a uh, lunatic asylum of the day and um, now if we talk about lycanthropy I, a good modern day case of this is uh, alleged case is of Bill Ramsey um, who growing up in none other than Essex the UK experienced uh, throughout his life he had feelings of going into fits of rage, panting like a dog and becoming extremely aggressive and brute like as if he was a wolf. And he was actually diagnosed with lycanthropy, which is someone that kind of has delusions that they think they're uh, a werewolf of sorts. Sometimes he was, his, his fingers were described as turning almost into claws. He wasn't a case of someone that necessarily was seen as a, a transforming werewolf, if we, if we believe this story. Just someone that had, like Jack Rolley, had certain characteristics. And when he went on certain episodes where he would, he would sort of transform into his wolf, there were actual recorded episodes where no one could go near him and the police had to use four or five men to trying to restrain him they got cuffs on him it wasn't enough 
calm him down in a cell. Now, this man, another more dark and significant werewolf case occurred in the early 17th century. Jean Grenier was a boy of 13 who was uh, like Rollet, what would be considered at the time to have been a half-wit, someone that struggled uh, mentally. And he also had natural canine-like features with jaws that stuck forward and canine teeth showing under his upper lip. He believed himself to be a werewolf. One evening, meeting some young girls, he terrified them by saying, as soon as the sun had set, he would turn into a wolf and eat them for supper. A few days later, one little girl, having gone out at nightfall to tend to the sheep, was attacked by some creature that in her terror she mistook for a wolf, but that afterwards proved to be none other than Jean Grenier. She beat him off with her sheep staff and fled home. When Jean was brought before the law courts of Bordeaux, he confessed that two years previously he had met the devil one night in the woods and signed a pact, receiving a wolf skin. With this skin, he had the ability to transform. He roamed about as a wolf after dark, resuming his human shape by daylight. He had killed and eaten several children whom he had found alone in the woods. And once he had entered a house, while the family were out and taken a baby from its cradle. A careful investigation by the court proved that these statements were true, certainly as far as the cannibalism was concerned. There is little doubt that the missing children were eaten by Jean Grenier, and there is no doubt that the mentally challenged boy was firmly convinced that he was a wolf. Now, lucky for Jean, he was only 13 and the judge leniency on him and concluded that he had been possessed by a demon resulting in lycanthropy and his sentence was to be sent to a monastery to live for the rest of his life. Grenier was examined by witch hunter of the time Pierre de Lange. The man who single-handedly initiated the Basque witch trials, so he had a history of hunting witches and werewolves in this case. A witch hunt that killed over 600 men and women in France almost a century before the Salem witch trials took place in colonial Massachusetts. He also wrote several popular volumes of religious anti-witch guides and witch hunting books. After several years at the monastery, de Lange examined Grenier and found the now mature man to be diminutive in stature, very shy and unwilling to look anyone in the face. His eyes were deep set and restless, his teeth long and protruding, his nails black and in places worn away. His mind was completely barren. He seemed unable to comprehend the smallest human things. So Grenier apparently, after being sent to the monastery, was still in a pretty feral state. Perhaps he'd hidden his skin that the devil gave him and was carrying on with his werewolf antics when the monks weren't looking. Just a theory. Another interesting historical case, this time from Germany, in 1589 was that of Peter Stube. It says that from his youth he was very into the occult. At a young age made a deal with the devil, wanting to do violence towards men, women and children. People who were kind of mischievous or um, a bit simple. In Stube's case he was, he was a vicious character. It says the devil gave him a belt which, uh, in Old English, we say, it says, which being put about him, he was straight transformed into the likeness of a greedy, devouring wolf. Strong and mighty, with eyes great and large, which in the night sparkled unto brands of fire. A mouth great and wide, with most sharp and cruel teeth, 
a huge body and mighty paws, and no sooner should he be put off the same girdle, but presently he should appear in his former shape, according to the proportion of a man, as if he had never been changed. So we mentioned changing and how sometimes <clears throat> changing could happen spontaneously, sometimes it's more controlled. In this case, he seems to have had more or less full control over his transformations. And unlike many cases of people who are said to have struggled with this, and like, for example, Bill Ramsey, he did not wish to hurt people. In this case, this guy was actually a serial killer who sometimes ate his victims over a 25 year period. He was also accused of incest with his daughter as well as killing and eating his son. When he was captured, Stoob told all about his deal with the devil and the magic belt that turned him into a wolf, confessing to murder, incest and cannibalism. Stoob's execution on October the 31st, 1589 in Bedburg, Germany was an exceptionally gruesome process. He was first lashed to a wheel, where the flesh was torn from his body with red-hot pincers. Next, his arms and legs were broken, his head was chopped off, and his body was burned. So, basically he was given a good old-fashioned medieval style horrific execution. Um, however, um, if we think about characters in modern times like Ted Bundy or so on, I mean, this guy was up there, whether or not he turned into a wolf or not, he was, he, he killed a lot of people. Uh, interestingly, some of these stories of werewolves are like this one, where the user is a, a vicious uh, nature that just wanted to use black magic to cause harm. Whereas others, it's seen more as like a curse. It's been recorded in medieval times, as I mentioned. It was often thought of as a curse for someone that had done something uh, to offend God and that the transformations. There are more modern cases. I believe there was an episode of Paranormal Witness where someone had, basically the episode insinuated that a man in America had had some sort of dealing with le lycanthropy. He was interested in uh, Norse runes and he'd managed to achieve transformation but whether this was done deliberately or not he had regretted it and a cabin was found in the woods where like a chain on the wall and lots of reinforced um, steel on the inside and lots of evidence of claw marks as if something savage had been contained in that room. Although um, I'm not sure about the val validity of this, it was an interesting episode nevertheless, as is often the case with that series. Yeah, he had become a werewolf and had not wanted to be one or had regretted it and when he transformed and went into a savage mode he responsibly would tie himself down. It's important to say at this point that I am not presenting any of these cases as fact. Of course, this is just talking in terms of these stories and, you know, they are claimed to be true stories and the listener can make of them what they wish. Some, to round off some sightings or stories rather from more recent years, um, in 1940. Six, for instance, a Navajo Indian reservation was frequently plagued by a murderous beast that was widely reported to be a werewolf. And Navajo traditions actually talk a lot about werewolves, according to the account. Three years later, in Rome, a police patrol was sent to investigate the strange behavior of a man suffering from werewolf delusions. He regularly lost control at the time of a full moon and let out loud and terrifying howls. So that sounds a bit more like along the lines of someone with this lycanthropy condition. In Singapore in 1957, police were again called to look into what the authorities believed was a long series of werewolf attacks on the residents of a particular nurse's hostel on the main island. 
One nurse awoke to find a horrible face with hair reaching to the bridge of the nose and long protruding fangs glaring down at her. The mystery was never solved, nor was the case of the 16-year-old schoolgirl at Rosario do Sol in southern Brazil, who in 1978 suffered terrible evil visions and demons, and who believed she had been taken over by the spirit of a savage wolf. In 1975, Britain's newspapers were full of the most extraordinary reports about a 17-year-old youth from the village of Eccles Hall, Staffordshire. So, again, um, about a decade before the South End werewolf. Awful belief this person would exhibit, you know, the symptoms of lycanthropy, face and hand changing colour, and he would... He would go quiet and start growling. And it said that, that this person was so affected by these thoughts and beliefs that he was turning into a wolf that he plunged a knife into his heart and commit suicide. So an interesting topic there. And these are just many accounts. Um, I know in America, they have a lot of people that are interested in the paranormal often talk about the dog man. And there's some brilliant um, sightings and accounts over there. Really fascinating. But here's a few and hopefully you enjoyed that. And, you know, it uh, spurs some thoughts on the topic. Of course, it's just fun and entertainment at the end of the day. But, you know, like a lot of us paranormal people, I want to believe because it's fun. And who knows? <laughs> Maybe there's a wolf hiding in... And in your closet. <laughs> Cheers, guys, and thanks for listening.